Start recording. This is a version of a talk that I gave for a writing conference over in Jacksonville. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to write for daily and weekly newspapers and have columns um, and write and edit for different book and magazine projects. So I've pretty much uh, been out there in the marketplace and rejected by some of the best magazines in the country because I'm not bashful about taking a shot at them. But in all of that experience, what I found is, and as I can, I now I uh, write a regular blog for the Orlando Sentinel.com that whether I'm writing for multimedia or if I'm writing for a traditional print publication, the things I have to do to actually sell my stuff, to propose my stories and to get them accepted, these are all still the same. And I think part of it is that a lot of the people who wind up being the editors and news directors on the big websites came out of traditional newspaper and magazine and uh, TV network and wire service backgrounds. So their sensibilities, their ideas of how to do journalism and what is worth paying for are going to be pretty consistent with the way that they did it when they worked on a print publication or a traditional broadcast station. So a lot of these principles will transfer over. What I want to do is get you all to think about yourselves as being in business because writing stories is nice. And if your family and friends read them and pat you on the head, that's nice. But if I'm going to spend gas money and I'm going to have to buy batteries for the camera and I got to have a website subscription, so I got to have expenses to do what I do, I want to get paid back. There is an old uh, standard amongst photographers because we love toys. We love getting new lenses and new flash units and all these things. But if you're a professional, you don't go buy a thing unless you already got two paying jobs in mind where you would use it. So if I bought some specialty lens that made fisheye pictures, I can't use them to shoot wedding portraits. The bride would come out looking ugly. So that lens is not going to make me money. On the other hand, if I go buy a 500 millimeter lens and I can shoot football and baseball with it, I can sell those pictures to newspapers and magazines so that lens will pay for itself. So we make business decisions because we're in the business of being professional writers. So in school, I can teach you professionalism in terms of ethics and techniques, but now I want to teach you professionalism and how to do business in the journalism trade. So that's what we're going to get after. So we have to figure out why we are doing writing. Now, uh, for some of us, even back to when I was a little kid, I wrote my own stories and drew my own comic books and wrote my own. Uh, I would write sports stories after watching a ball game on TV. It just was something that was in my body, right? So one reason we do this is to write whatever it is we want to write and then sell it. Now, the other way that jobs happen is that magazine editors call you and offer you money to write articles. I actually had that happen once. Uh, I was on summer vacation between semesters, and the phone went off, and I picked it up. I just said, hello, and a voice on the other end said, you speak French, right? So I said, who is this? And it was an editor I worked with up in New Jersey who had an interview lined up with an artist, but the artist and his manager only spoke kind of good English. Their native language was French. So if I spoke enough French and they spoke enough English, we could do the interview. So I got a job because of that. But I really got the job because I had done other work for this guy and turned it in on time or early. So he was a happy editor with me. And then when he was in a jam, I was who he called. So how do we build that reputation so that uh, people just uh, shoot you an email and say, hey, you want to make some money? Uh, I would like to be in that position. I enjoy that when people offer me money I didn't ask for. So your skill set should be able to get you in a position where that can start happening for you. So I think we can have both. I, I like to go out and 
cover concerts or ball games or cover public events that I would go to anyway. For about 15 years, I never bought a ticket for a sports event because I always had sideline photo passes or press box passes. So I was going, I just didn't have to pay for parking or to get in. So that's the first case where I get to write what I want to do and then get paid for it. However, sometimes a magazine editor will call you or a, a website director or a TV station and say, hey, you're, you're there in Daytona Beach. It's by bike week. Can you go get something for us on that? And to which I would say, I don't have a motorcycle. I don't ride. But yeah, I'm three minutes from where all the stuff is going on. So yeah, I'll go take some pictures for you and uh, see what I can get. So sometimes just, just because you're the person in the place that is handy to what, uh, what they need to get done, whether you are interested in it or not. And in either case, if I'm getting paid, I'm going. If I'm not getting paid, I'm not getting out of bed. Now, we're going to talk about nonfiction. If you want to write poetry and short stories and novels and those kinds of things, we can have a whole separate discussion because I've done some of that, but not nearly as much as I have of doing traditional style journalism articles like we talk about in this class. So we're going to hold it to nonfiction. So there are really two places to go. The first is traditional print. If you go to a bookstore, if you go to Barnes & Noble, half of the wall is tied up with magazines. So the predictions that the magazine business was going away is not true. In fact, I get offers all the time from magazines who want me to have free subscriptions simply because uh, they think I have a big office with a big waiting room. And I go ahead and I take all the free magazines because in my business, it's good for me to see what's going on and flip it through and uh, see how magazines are put together and how they organize their sections. So really, whatever it is you like, if you like to crochet, if you like cats, if you like uh, antique uh, military aircraft, if you play the guitar, there's a magazine. And if one magazine is making money, you can expect that there are two or three others that will copy that. Now, the good side about magazines is you get high credibility because when you're published in The New Yorker or... Um, if you're published in Sports Illustrated, that's big because magazines have a finite number of pages. So there's big competition for trying to get in there. It is very tough to crack into that market. But when you do, you get paid. And we'll talk about the money aspect of it in a moment. Now, when we talk about new media, websites and electronic newsletters and electronic journals, these people are hungry for content. They are less likely to pay new writers because you haven't proven that you're worth money yet. However, they are very likely to grab your story and publish it. Now, the advantage to that is that your stuff has passed through at least one other person. See, if you publish it on your own website, you're your own editor. So even though I critique your articles, I can't stop you from hanging up your story. So you could write garbage and put it up there and say, look, I'm published. But in traditional sense, in professional sense, you get published when somebody else, some editor, some news uh, uh, media moderator who has a forum of some kind, has evaluated your work and said, yep, it's good enough, we will run it. So when you pass the bar of somebody else's approval to get into stuff that they control and that you don't, that is getting published. If it's just open posting where you can hang up anything you want to, that's not really getting published. See, for me to get picked up by the Orlando Sentinel, even with all my experience, I had to send them some sample articles. And then it took about 30 days for them to get together and decide who were going to get opportunities to be new columnists, to be new bloggers for them. So even with 30 plus years experience and envelopes and envelopes of clippings and printouts of stuff that I have done, I still had to go through the application process and get approved. So that's what you do at reputable new media. 
Now, eventually, some of these electronic newsletters and websites do pay off. Now, I've gotten little checks like $10 or $15 for writing movie reviews or book reviews, things like that. However, they still count because somebody had to approve putting up your story. Nobody cares how much you got paid. When you can put in your letter later on, that you say, yes, I've been paid to write for New York Review of Science Fiction and so on and so on. Even though they only paid you $10 an article, you still got paid. Somebody approved you. So if it was an electronic journal or a newsletter or a website that picked up your story and had to approve you independent of your own loving of your own story, then that is getting published then if they someday start sending you 5 and $10 checks because your stuff is really good and they want you to be a regular, now you are a paid journalist. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you get paid $5 or $5,000. Somebody approved you. Somebody paid you. So now you are a bigger deal than you were before that moment. Now, there are two basic strategies that you can take when you want to start getting paid for your articles. One is on the left where you already wrote an article, you already took the pictures, and you want to find a place to put them. Now, any place in here where I say magazine or publication, you can also insert website or electronic news service because they all operate the same way. So the electronic media, they just have a faster turnaround, but the process is still the same. So on the one hand, on the left, I went out and wrote whatever I wanted to, and I took my own pictures, and that's what I did. And now I want somebody to buy it. On the other side, on the right side, are two magazines I have yet to be two magazines I have yet to be published in. I desperately want to be uh, read back home in Texas, so I would like to get a nice article in Texas Monthly or in Cowboys and Indians, because those are. Uh, my favorite magazines that have my, my Western spirit in them. So if I want to get a story into that magazine, I better conform to what the magazine wants instead of what I want to do. So I'll do anything they want to get in there. The left-hand example is I already did whatever I wanted to, and now I got to find somebody that will want it. So let me talk about these two strategies and break them down for you. If I already wrote the article and now I'm hunting a place to put it, the advantage is I got to do what made me feel good. So I went out and I did a story on whatever it was. Uh, I did an interview, for example, with the guy who used to be the world's fast draw champion. Uh, back in the 50s, he was on one of the first Jerry Lewis telethons and, you know, he did cowboy and Western shows and stuff like that and was a stuntman in movies and TV. So I did a nice interview with him all about his career, and I got pictures of his guns and all of that stuff. So I got to do what I wanted to do. I got to meet a guy that I thought was cool, and I got to talk about stuff that I found interesting. So that was great. Secondly, I now have an inventory piece. I have a story that's all written up that could be a filler for somebody that might want it. So I have a finished article, and I have a nice batch of pictures. Now, here are the disadvantages. One of them is your article can get stale. If I went out and did a story with a guy, uh, let's say he's a, a, a biology researcher, and I do a story with him about Ebola, I better get that story sold right now because once this health crisis is over or once the news media's attention moves on to uh, the elections in November, nobody's going to want my story. So if I went out and wrote something and it has perishable news value, I got to sell it fast. And the other disadvantage is now I have to do a whole nother set of work to find a place to put it. So unless you already know every newspaper, magazine director and website uh, manager in the world, you got to do a lot of research to find a place that might want your story. So in addition to the work that you did to write the article, now you got to do more work to find a place to put it. Now, if you had, you know, a once in a lifetime chance, you know, it, if you happen to be uh, sitting on an airplane with Bill Clinton and you get to talk to him for two hours, I would write that story. I would get it. And then I'd find a place to put it. OK, whether anybody was asking for it or not, I would take advantage of that opportunity. 
So I'm not saying that writing the article first is bad. I'm just saying that it comes with certain handicaps. Now, the other side, you found a place that you would really like to be published, like I have those two favorite magazines I want to get into. If you already have some publishing venue picked out, be it a, a website or a syndication service or a stock photo agency, whatever it is, but the company already exists and you have identified it, first, you are more likely to get paid and you are more likely to get published because you have already identified a professional outlet. You've already found a place to go. Now, here are the disadvantages. One of them is you might have to make changes in your article. I wrote what I thought was a pretty simple a uh, knockdown, drag out review of an academic book about horror movies. Um, it's October, so horror movies and all that stuff come out in October. Anyway, this professor over in, in Italy had decided he was going to study the classic horror movies of the 1930s. So the original Dracula and Frankenstein and King Kong and the mummy and all of that. And he looked at him as a sociologist. What does that tell us about American society of the 1930s in the Great Depression? So it was a very interesting thing because he knows about film and he knows about sociology. Plus, he wasn't American. So he was looking at us from the outside kind of more objectively. So I just thought it was a really good book. So I wrote a review of it and sent it off to a journal that publishes such articles. The editor really liked it. And he said, however, I think you need to look more into this psychological influence that the guy mentioned in his book. So then I had to go research that psychological influence. And then I had to go find uh, some stuff that was actually written in French because that stuff that I put in referenced a French author. So the editor said, no, I'll, I don't think that's what he meant. You need to check what he said. So I had to write that what I thought was just, you know, one Saturday afternoon's work. I had to rewrite that three times. But it got in. It got published. And it was a much better article because that was a very good editor. He was asking the right kinds of questions to improve my article. So if you want to get into somebody else's space, you're going to have to satisfy what they want and how they want it. The good thing is... Those people then realize you are somebody that they can work with, that will take constructive criticism, and that will uh, participate in the creative process. And to me, that is a mark of being a real professional. Because if you say, oh, no, I wrote it, I'm not changing anything, until you own your own book publishing company, your stuff may never get out. So being able to work well with editors, really an important thing. Now. Let's get into how to figure out where and how to get paid. I think it's important to analyze the place where you want to get published. So be it a, a website or a magazine or a book publisher. Uh, sometimes there are nonfiction anthologies. I've written for some of these where the book is actually a collection of chapters written by different authors. So there are lots of ways to do this. Any professional outfit somewhere has a way for you to contact them and ask them what they want. Because as an editor, when I was on the other side of the desk, I would have people sending us stuff that was totally inappropriate, had no business even being in our mailbox. Because they didn't understand what we published or what we were trying to do. On the other hand... The people that actually read our writer's guidelines and submitted stuff in the way that we wanted it, oh, I love those people. I gave them more work because they at least had enough sense to come in out of the rain. So somewhere in the fine print in the front of every magazine, usually it's in the masthead where they list all the editors and assistant editors and advertising managers and all of that stuff. Somewhere down on the bottom of that, they tell you what sort of articles they are considering and how they want them submitted. So that um, they'll tell you that uh, we only want uh, articles submitted in Microsoft Word. We only want uh, JPEG photos. We only want this level of resolution. You know, we only want 1200 DPI. They'll tell you 
how to make them happy. So why not just do it the way that they're asking for? So that information is usually somewhere inside every publication in their directory area. Now, on most websites, even the ones for professional news and sports organizations, somewhere under their Contact Us button, and it may be called different things, but somewhere on every website, there's something that says, get in touch with us. And when you hit that Contact Us, yeah, there are places like, um, here's where to complain about your uh, subscription, here's how to pay for your membership, and stuff like that. But if they are accepting freelance information, there will be a thing in there that says write for us or contribute or have a story idea question mark. But there will be some sort of link or button if they have a, uh, an acceptance of outside writers. So somewhere across the menu bar on most websites, if they accept outside submissions, you click that to find it. The other thing that I like to do is I like to study the target. Back when I was doing newspaper work, I got to interview an army ranger who had gone overseas to enlist in another army because he was, he was fighting a terrorist over in Rhodesia, and he got a commission in the Rhodesian army. And when he came back to Florida after a tour of that, he was running for Congress. So in my research on the candidate, I looked for articles that he had written about his wartime experiences. So I started studying that magazine and said, hey, I could write this good. And I started looking at the different departments in the magazine. You know, they had reviews of equipment. They had short news briefs. They had long feature stories. They had interviews. They had historical articles. They had picture essays. So I started studying what departments they had, how they were put together, because I was going to get in here and I was going to get paid by these guys. I just need to figure out what kind of articles I might want to write and what sections of their magazine that they would fit into. That way, in my letter, I could kind of suggest where I thought my article might go well. And what that does is it tells the editor the decision maker, that you've taken the time to study them and that you are trying to do it the way that they like it, which makes them more disposed to want to work with you. Now, there are secondary sources. Every year, there's a book that comes out called Writer's Market. And it used to just be for people who wanted to sell a novel or sell their short stories. But as the media has changed, it continues to include reviews of major websites, wire services, I mean, even greeting card companies. If you want to write poems for greeting cards, you can get paid for that, too. Writer's Market comes out in book form, usually when the Christmas books start to come out. So if you go to the major bookstores like Barnes & Noble and Books A Million and such, when you start seeing the holiday books come out, like the fancy gift sets and those kinds of things, that and the uh, the World Almanac for next year, then this writer's market will probably come out too. So that's a pretty handy annual thing to get. Most libraries will have them in their reference section. So if you just want to go check one out for free, um, a lot of these things don't change very much from year to year, except in terms of the personnel working at the place. But it would give you an idea um, for example, if I pulled up Texas Monthly in Writer's Market, it would tell me that it is 50% staff written, which means half the time they already got a guy on salary who's writing. They would say uh, they do accept book reviews and movie reviews. Holiday articles must be submitted six months in advance. So that means that you're uh, Springtime articles you ought to be working on now. Your Christmas articles you should have been working on back in June. So um, they give you a lot of interesting information, insight into how the magazine works. And they get this from the magazine people. So the, the magazine people do not want to waste their time reading stuff they can't use. So they would much rather put out openly, hey, if you want to write for us and you're serious about it, do it like this. Now, there are other magazines, Writer's Digest, The Writer, uh, Poets and Writers is also good. 
Um, editor and publisher is the trade magazine for newspapers and magazines, and a lot of job announcements come up in there. But also, these magazines also have websites and electronic newsletters that you can subscribe to. And then you get monthly and even more frequent information about new magazines or changes in editorial direction or um, this this organization has put up an electronic newsletter and they're looking for contributors. I get this all the time for my academic writing so that my inbox, I usually get 10 offers a week for conferences looking for speakers and academic journals looking for articles and writing contests and things like that. So if you get out there into the marketplace, people will actually send you opportunities to write. Now, let's talk about how to tear down a set of writer's guidelines once you receive them. What are we looking for? It will tell you how long the story needs to be. That's why our assignments in this program come with word limits. They come with numbers of uh, pieces of media that you need to include because if they tell you we want a 1,000 word movie review and you write a 5,000 word movie review, they're just going to reject it. They're not going to take the time to rewrite it because you can't follow instructions. So I try and get as close to the length that they're asking for. Now, in general terms, we think a double space typed page is about 300 words. That's about the average. So when we were assigning essays in composition classes, if we want a thousand word essay, we would just say, give me three, three and a half pages. Because then by rough figuring, I know you're going to come in somewhere near a thousand words. This is not like the old days when Charles Dickens got paid a penny a word when he wrote articles, which is why uh, A Tale of Two Cities seems to go on forever. Because he was getting paid a penny a word, and every chapter was uh, worth money. So the more words he would write, the more he got paid. Now we tend to pay by the job. But the point here is, if they tell you a thousand words for a movie review, write a thousand words. Don't write 700, don't write 1,200. What this means is, we edit ourselves before we turn the story in. That's important. If you are a good editor of yourself, you will wind up writing tighter, more efficient, more well-packed articles because you're trying to get 1,500 words into a 1,000 word space, then you're going to cut out all your own superfluous language. You're going to cut out all your own adjectives and adverbs, and you will pick better nouns and better verbs to start with so that your language will be more descriptive. And I think you'll also wind up outlining and then executing your outline instead of just rambling through a story. Because to make a story fit in space, you got to plan it. I got a thousand words, so I need 50 to 75 for my opening, 50 to 75 for my closing. I need about 25 to put in the name of the movie and the director and the release date in the studio. All right, so I've just burned 125 words before I ever said anything about the movie. Okay. I got 800 left maybe to work with for my creativity. That means I can put in four 200 word paragraphs. So I got to make an outline how I'm going to describe my movie. That's just to bang out a movie review that I could probably dictate into my phone on my way home from the theater. So to do professional work, we outline, we edit, we nail the word length exactly the way that the guy who's going to write us a check wants it to be. They will also tell you about the way they want the thing submitted. Sometimes they want it sent in on disk rather than by email. I often run into this when they want high resolution uh, digital photography because if I try and send you a, a bunch of three meg photographs over email, I will clog up your inbox. Or it may never transmit. It may be hung up in an email server somewhere. But if they want your super high-resolution pictures, or if they want audio or video clips from you for the website, they may have a Dropbox account that they want you to put it in so they can pull it down. Or they may want you to send it in on a CD or DVD. 
or they may still want you to send a paper copy along with an electronic copy. I've had that happen with academic journals because they want the paper copy to take my name off the title page. They tear the title page off and send the article out blind to a couple of people to read and review. And then they've still got the electronic file so they can easily edit that and put it into the magazine. So however it is that they say they want it, again, that's how you send it to them. So if they want it by email with no phone calls afterwards, then that's what you do. My ex-girlfriend, who just got married, and I'm actually happy about it, sent her a congratulations. She was working as a poet. Now, she's still an English teacher, and she writes uh, comedy skits and things like that. But poetry was her main thing. So she actually had a board in her office at her apartment. She had a separate writing room like I do. And on that wall was like a calendar of every poem she sent out. So she had this dry erase board. When she sent it out, who she sent it to, and when she should hear back from them. So she might have 20 or 30 poems in circulation at a time. Because this was a big board. It was like a sales uh, chart at a dealership for uh, selling cars. But the point was, when an article came back or a poem came back, then she would repackage it, send it to the next magazine on her list, and she would update her assignment board. So she was running missions as if she was a squadron commander and all of her poems were airplanes. So with that business-like approach, she has now published three books. Because she works at her work. So following these formats, submitting it the way that they say that they do, make a note of uh, what you hear back, how long it takes them to review articles, all of that are parts of your being in business. Now, art formats. Sometimes they want charts. Sometimes they want uh, photographs. And they will tell you if they want JPEGs or if they want TIFFs if they want PNGs. So what you have learned in your Photoshop class about different file formats and resolutions and whether they want it color corrected or not because they may want to do that themselves, they may want the raw image, that will be in their specifications about how they want the art format. Now let's talk about money. That's where we get into rights and kill fees. When you sell an article to anybody, the typical thing that you are selling them is called first-time North American serial rights, which means that in the United States and Canada, they can publish your story one time. I've worked with magazines that also had British counterparts. So if they wanted to sell it to the British magazine and publish it over there, they had to pay me twice because I only sold them the U.S. and Canada rights. If they wanted the British rights, they had to pay me a second time. Sometimes I wrote articles that were so good, yes, I'm bragging, that they would put it in their annual collection for the best of 1989. So if they did that, then they had to pay me again for the reprint fee. Sometimes I did photos that were so good they got on the covers of the magazines. You get a bonus for that because they think your photo is good enough that people will pick the magazine off the rack. That's how they pick cover photos. So, yeah, I should get an extra $100 if you put my picture on the cover. Sometimes they would use my pictures in ads, like they have, would have ads in the magazine to uh, promote their other products and things. If they use one of my illustrations for that, then they had to pay me for the commercial rights. I've got some photographs I've sold six and seven times because they were good enough that they were used in different ways. They had to buy the rights to that photograph every time they wanted to use it in a different way. You don't want to sign your story or your picture or your audio or video over for life. This is what happened to the guys that created Superman. They sold the character to the comic book company, and then when they started having cartoons and movies and lunch boxes and all of that stuff, those guys got nothing. One of them died broke. The other one died blind. I mean, it was terrible, and, and people took up a collection in the industry 
And now it's changed that if you create a character, you still own that character and you rent it to the company. So you want to be careful. Uh, when you first start out, you're not going to have a big negotiating position. You're not going to get to argue with these guys because you're just happy to get paid anything. But at some point, you'll reach that uh, position where you can say, uh, no, uh, I I'm only selling you the one-time rights. Or uh, if you put this on the cover, I want to get a bonus. Or you know, you start looking for those things in the agreement. At first, the agreement might be nothing more than an email that comes back and you write, yes, okay, and that's all there is to it. Uh, very seldom did I ever get to a point where I was actually getting a contract, and that's from the big magazines and the, the big uh, outlets. A kill fee is not when they pay you to assassinate somebody. It's when you have an assignment. For example... If, if they ask me, would you go over to Tampa and cover a monster truck pull? Well, okay. I like going to, uh, to Tampa. I don't care anything about monster trucks, but okay, I'll go. So I go, and it costs me a tank of gas, and it costs me a night in a hotel, and a couple of meals away from home. And then they say, eh, we don't want the monster truck story after all, even after I turn it in and it was acceptable. Okay, well, they still owe me my expenses, or they owe me half of what the agreed-to amount was for the article, because I'm not leaving the county unless I have some guarantee that I'm getting something back. Now, if they buy the whole article at the agreed-upon price, then my expenses are something I take off my taxes next year as business write-off. But if the, if I go over there and do the work to the standard that they wanted it, and then they wind up not using it, I should still get paid because I went out of my way to go do this thing. So a kill fee is when you get paid after you did acceptable work. Now, if I go over to Tampa and I do a horrible job on the story and none of my pictures turn out and I never do get an interview with the winning truck driver, they don't owe me anything because I was awful. I didn't get the job done. So they don't owe me a kill fee because I did crummy work. If I did acceptable work that they engaged me to do in advance at an expected price, then when they change their mind, they still owe me something. And that kill fee may be just my expenses. It may be half of what the article was worth. But that is usually in there when they give you some kind of assignment like that where they have engaged you in advance to go do something. The other thing that you want to watch out for is when you get paid. Do you get paid when they accept the article, or do you get paid when the magazine or the book comes out? Because sometimes you write an article, and they sit on it and don't use it for a while. Sometimes, and I've run into this, with new publications... They don't have a lot of cash sitting around, so they're waiting on what magazines they sold to take the money out of that to pay their bills. So until they sell enough magazines, uh, you're not getting paid. So that magazine has to hit the stands before they send you a check. I like working with the companies that as soon as they say thanks for the article, there is a check coming right behind it. So you want to know, do you get paid when they accept the article or do you get paid when they publish the article? Now, obviously, in new media, it is much faster. So uh, if they are paying for your story, you just give them your PayPal account number and uh, bang Zoom as soon as you hit uh, – as soon as they hit uh, submit, you get paid. Um, so in those cases, I love it because um, it's, it's almost instantaneous. But with the traditional, more prestigious media, yeah, it could be 30, 60, 90 days before you get paid. So kind of like the ex-girlfriend did, having a lot of stuff in circulation means you're always sending something out and there's always money coming in. It just may not be for the same job. You may be receiving money for the stuff that you wrote in July right now, and you're sending out stuff that you're going to get paid for in January. So as long as you keep stuff in circulation... I know a lot of people make a, a nice second living doing this, but they have to stay busy. 
Now, when you dig through the magazine, or when you're evaluating a website, or you're looking at um, even uh, TV and radio productions, because if you watch closely, there are people who sell freelance articles to TV stations. There's a fella I know over in Tallahassee because it's the state capital. He basically does television stories on state government, and then he sends them to medium-sized TV stations that can't afford to have their own Tallahassee correspondent. So he is the Tallahassee Bureau for about 30 different TV stations. So he'll go cover some uh, hearing in the state legislature and then film a two-minute story about it and then um, fire that thing off. And 20, 30 stations get it. It's funny because as I've moved around the state, so like I'll watch TV in Ocala, Gainesville, Orlando, Tampa, Panama City, I still see the same guy being the Tallahassee correspondent. And what that means is, is that those TV stations would rather pay him a hundred bucks a story than pay their own man to drive all the way up to Tallahassee and get it for themselves. So he's figured out a way to be a freelancer for TV stations. Um, over in our public relations program, we talk a lot about electronic news releases, and that's kind of what he's doing. Uh, he is a provider of content. So you have the opportunity coming out of the new media program to be a website content provider for all kinds of things. You know, if you decide sports or entertainment or politics or business, whatever field you want to be in, you look at the places that are the, the best of the best, that are the, the websites that you go to to get your news. Why can't you write it for them yourself? Based on where you're located, you might have stories that you could send up to the Yahoo News homepage. So um, when we evaluate any outlet, we want to find out how much of this is staff written and how much of it is freelance, meaning how much of it is coming from salaried reporters that work there and how much of it do they just buy from people around the country. Second thing you want to know is, do they take unsolicited articles or only commissioned ones? And what proportion is that? Unsolicited means I just wrote an article and I sent it to you out of the blue. You never heard of me. You don't know where I am or what I'm doing. And just suddenly an article shows up. Some of the bigger outfits do not even accept stuff like that. They want you to at least have contacted them and said, hey, how about if I send you a story about X? And that gives the editor the chance to say, nah, we don't want any of that. Or, wow, you can get a story about X? Yeah, do it, and here's how long I want it, and I'll pay you $100. So commissioned means that you have at least written to somebody in responsibility who wrote back to you that said, go do it. Once they say, go do it, you are commissioned. Now, sometimes when you get commissioned, they're still not guaranteeing they're going to pay you because maybe you don't have a record with them yet. And that means that you're writing on spec, O-N-S-P-E-C, which is short for on speculation, meaning they are speculating that from what you've told them, you might turn in a good story. But since they don't have any guarantee of that, they're saying, yeah, go ahead and say that you're writing it for field and stream. And if it's any good, uh, we'll consider running it. So then you can show up at some fishing tournament and say, yeah, yeah, I'm here for field and stream, and I want to know if I can talk to the tournament organizer and uh, the best fish. So uh, you, you at least have, get access to the event. I like to actually print out the email I get from the magazine editor or carry a copy of the letter with me in my bag so that I have some proof. Because obviously, I don't have business cards that say Field and Stream on them. I don't have a photo ID that says Correspondent Field and Stream Magazine. But I do have a note that says I'm here doing this on their behalf. Because people will just look at you just showing up from nowhere with a camera and saying, Hey, I want to come cover your tournament. Well, who are you and who sent you? And then you pull out your little letter. Columns. The opinion articles are almost always staff written, 
meaning somebody that works here has earned the right to write a column. Usually, people have to be a reporter for a while and get a good record of credibility with the editor, and then the editor may promote them to an opportunity to write a column or to write an opinion piece. They used to tell us, you don't get to have an opinion until I tell you you do. So being a columnist is a tough thing to get. You got to have a long track record and be an expert about something. However, if you want to publish opinion, there are places that will accept letters to the editor or, or comments and guest comments. Uh, when you have me in month 10, I actually do a whole week with you on how to go get published like that on different websites where you want to piggyback onto what prestigious writers have said, and you want to get yourself noted for being a commentator about what they wrote. I actually know people who got their big break as writers by being good letter writers so that they would regularly write letters into certain publications, and the editors got to know them, and they go, well, this guy has a good opinion. He has some good thoughts about stuff. Let's give him a shot at writing something for us. So anytime you get your name and your words out there, it can be good for you. Another thing that happens in a lot of uh, places, because they are so hungry for content, that reviews like book reviews, product reviews, like I actually had somebody send me gun oil and I wrote a review on this new gun oil. Now, I got a whole box of free gun oil out of it, but I also got two paragraphs published in the magazine and a $25 check. So because I tried it out and, and wrote up uh, my impressions of it. News briefs. When the Air Force decided to create Space Command, which would be over missiles and satellites and things like that, I got the word on that from a contact on mine in the Air Force. And I got a look at what the patch was going to look like. So I got a picture of the patch and I copied the news release and I wrote that up and I put that into a military magazine. Again, it was one picture and a couple of paragraphs, but it was another $25 check. So these little news briefs, that's another way to get in. So that if you can be the person that sends out news nuggets and you don't mind getting 10 little checks instead of one big one, then there are opportunities for you. Now, if you want to get commissioned, if you want a proper magazine, book publisher, um, TV station, or wire service to let you use their good name to go out and go to work uh, on a story, you have to write what's called a query letter. Query, of course, is a variation of the simple word question, because what you're doing is you're asking them a question. Can I go represent you at this event? and then send you a story and pictures. So basically, you're asking for permission to be their agent. When you think about it, uh, the big magazines, Road and Track, Car and Driver, Woman's Day, whoever it is, they can't possibly have enough people all over the world to get all the stories that they might possibly use. So instead, they rely on people like you and I to offer them stories. But we offer them first via the query letter. So the first thing you got to do is pitch them the story. The first paragraph of your query letter is essentially the lead for what your proposed story would be. So you're going to tell the story of Siamese twins who were separated uh, because one of them wanted to get married. Wow, that's interesting. I want to read that story. So the pitch the first paragraph of your query letter has got to be the, wow, I want to read that story sentence. Sometimes I actually did it as a question. What if I could tell you the story of an officer reuniting with his Jeep driver after 50 years when both of them served under General Patton? Wow, Patton's interesting. Anything about Patton uh, can, can work on our magazine, and that's kind of got a human interest thing about two GIs meeting each other after all those years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I'd want to see that. If you can make the editor think that when they're reading, then you have a chance to get to the second paragraph of your letter. Okay? So the first paragraph, we're going to do the uh, 
We're going to do the uh, Jeep driver patent reunion thing. All right. That's what I want to talk about. So that's what I'm going to pitch. I actually did that story so I can tell you about it. Now, why am I a credible writer about stuff like this? Well, I covered military affairs for uh, the Panama City News Herald. Uh, I've covered a lot of military maneuvers and events. I've even gone out on naval ships and gone out on maneuvers with the Coast Guard. So I've covered a lot of military topics and even grew up in a military family myself. Okay, there's paragraph number two. We've explained why I am a proper writer to execute this kind of story. I've been around military stuff. I grew up in it. I've done some writing about it already. Cool. Okay, so this guy is not going to call a sergeant a colonel. He won't make stupid mistakes. Now, second or the third paragraph. How do you know I am a professional writer? In addition to my newspaper work, I've also published my articles in Combat Weapons, Soldier of Fortune, Gung Ho, and other national military magazines. Well, see, that says that other people with credibility paid me. Must mean I turned stuff in on time and the editor thought it was good enough to use. Now, what can I deliver? What will they receive from me? I think this article would run 5,000 to 7,000 words. I could also do a sidebar article about the Jeep of that era. Because people like stories about old cars and old military equipment, I could do a little research piece, do a little biography on the, the Jeep of 500 words. I've got access to their old photos from their scrapbooks, and I can also take uh, digital photos of the two men today and capture some audio and video clips in case you also want to promote this article on your magazine's website. See, now in my last paragraph, I told them what they can buy from me. I've also indicated what my capabilities are that I can write and I can shoot and I can edit and I can put this on a CD or email it to you or, or what have you. But I've indicated that they don't have to send a photographer. I don't have to hire a photographer. I can do that myself and that I can deliver all these different electronic formats or physical formats. Why is that important? It gives the editor the opportunity to understand what I can work with, because what if he says, well, really, I would rather that you did the whole thing as a video interview, because then we can rip still photos off the video in our shop up here. So he doesn't want me taking still pictures. He just wants me to get it on video. Cool, boss. Whatever you want, you're writing the check. But at the very least, can you see here in my little outline, four paragraphs, I have now made a professional presentation of me doing the story about the two GIs meeting after 40 years. So he has some idea now of what my story is and my ability to deliver it. Now, how do you make an editor fall in love with you and have all your babies? Okay. We want editors to love us so much that they want to pay us all the time. So, first thing, I like including sidebar articles. If you look at magazines and newspapers, you'll see sometimes a little article in a shaded box sitting next to the main article. And I think this is beneficial for two reasons. First, if the editor wants to, they can edit it into your main article. So let's say I write three or four paragraphs about the, the history and deployment of the Jeep in World War II. Yeah, okay. If he doesn't want it, he can throw it away. Or if he thinks he's got enough card geeks that read his magazine, he can edit that into the body of my story. Or if he didn't sell enough ads on all the pages of my story... He can take my little thing about Jeeps and use that to fill up space where he didn't have a paid advertisement. So what I'm doing is I'm giving the editor some optional material that they can work with in multiple ways. It's always better for them to have it and not need it than need an extra 600 words and you didn't give them any. 
I like the idea of providing many illustrations. Now, not hundreds. I'm not going to send them a whole CD full of pictures because it'll take them all day to look at 200 photographs and pick two that they're going to use. However, I want to make sure that I take my photographs from a couple of different angles. I was covering um, uh, an international sniper contest. I go, I go do some interesting stuff. But I wanted to make sure I had pictures of the rifles pointing to the left and the rifles pointing to the right. Why would I want to do that? Because when he lays out the article, maybe he wants the picture on the left, maybe he wants the picture on the right. But we always want it pointing at the story. So when I critique stories that you guys put on your website, sometimes I will tell you, that photo should have been on the right-hand side of the page instead of the left hand because that's the way the car was pointing. So every photograph has some sort of direction to it. So even if somebody has just turned their head a little bit to one side, that now becomes the front. That's where the photo is aiming. And you always want the story to aim or the picture to aim towards the story. You don't want to give people an excuse by following the picture for their eyes to go away from your story. So I like to make sure that I got left-handed and right-handed pictures. Now, why can't I just flop the photo? Well, if the guy's uniform has writing on it, the words would be backwards. And most people's faces do not have perfect symmetry between left side and right side. I part my hair on the left. So all of these things are reasons why we can't just digitally manipulate the photograph. So you as the photographer, you got to get up and move and take a picture from the left of whatever it is. Take a picture from the right. Take a picture that's vertical, a tall photograph. Take a horizontal picture. For example, I was uh, covering a concert. If I, and if I shoot the guitar player from the waist up, I have a horizontal picture because I'm just going to get the guitar and his arms and his head. If I shoot him from the feet up, it's going to be a vertical picture because now the picture becomes tall instead of wide. So you want, you want to give the editor some options. Give him some tall ones. Give him some wide ones. Give him some left-handed. Give him some right-handed. Doesn't mean you have to take every picture four different ways. Just make sure that you have multiple angles. You've got close-ups. You've got wide shots. If you take every picture from the same place, they're all going to look alike, and I'm only going to want one of them. But if you took three or four different ones from high angle, low angle, laying on your belly, you know, through a window, you got all these different uh, kinds of pictures, I might pay you more because you gave me more stuff. Also, being able to take your own pictures means you don't have to split the check. I learned this very early in my career that being a writer slash photographer was a big deal because that meant that I would be able to go when I needed to go and not have to wait for a photographer to go with me. When I was in newspaper work, we only had two photographers and six reporters. So if you wanted a photographer to go with you, you had to get in line. But if you had your own camera, you could go when you felt like it. So not having to split the check was good. Getting bonuses for cover photos and things on top of what I was getting paid for the article, that was good. And sometimes your pictures sell the story. Now, I've also done it the other way around. Sometimes I have written stories in order to sell a package of pictures I already had. For example, uh, in covering sports, I wound up shooting a lot of pro wrestling and traveling around the country. I wound up with thousands of pictures of, of great, uh, great wrestlers. Now, how do I get paid again? I wrote articles that were like fantasy matches. What if, what if Hulk Hogan ever got to wrestle Ric Flair? How would that match go? And then I could use photos I already took and just write kind of a fantasy story that went with it. And the fans loved reading that kind of stuff. Then I started doing articles called Know Your Holds, where I would write an article about how wrestlers do a certain hold. And I got pictures I already took of guys doing that hold. So again, I get paid twice for the same picture. 
So having the illustrations sometimes gives you an opportunity to write a story about them. I did an article once um, just on how to photograph female bodybuilders because I had covered a lot of physique contests. And then I figured, well, wait, I could write an instructional article about how I do it, which meant then I got to sell my pictures twice. So uh, I don't mind telling you, I like making money and I like spending it after I get it. Uh, another thing editors love is when you deliver early rather than at the last minute. Because let's say you turn in the article and I need you to rewrite it, or I want you to get me one extra picture of something, or it's a little bit too long, can you cut it? And I would rather make the edits on the article myself than let the editor do it. Because I know how I think my story ought to flow, or I know what I think is an important detail. So if I want to keep this certain quote in the story, I would rather have time for me to re-edit that thing than to let somebody else do it because they might put in something or take out something that I felt strongly about. So being on time is nice. Being early is even better. My dad used to tell me, if you ain't early, you're late. So if you use those principles, you have the chance to get paid. And here are some of the various magazines in which I've sold articles. So, you know, everything from military stuff to martial arts stuff to sports stuff to education, TV magazines. I don't care. I like getting paid. And every time I sell one, it goes on the resume as another place where I can use that credibility to get to my next job. So delivering for one means I have the chance to do number two. Delivering for two means I have the chance to do number three, and on and on it goes. Okay, Deborah, any questions about what we covered? Did you get some ideas? Um, I, I got a lot of ideas. It was very informative. Um, I think I, I heard you it. typing notes. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I do that. <laughs> I did. I, I took a lot of notes. Um, from what you said in the, the slides. And so um, very helpful information. Um, and I I don't really have any questions because it was very plain. But well, I, I tell appreciate you, it. Well, I tell you, I had one student and uh, I've gotten to know her dad. And she is out covering stories about veterans who are having difficulty adjusting after they get back. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's just, she's so good. I mean, these are people stories and it's timely and it's heart wrenching and she does great photography. I mean, it. so I worked with her separately and said, okay, let's get you published. Cause right now with all the veterans hospital scandals, yes. people would be interested in getting these stories, you know, so if they got to support the troops mentality or they want to do something that further bashes the VA hospitals, there's multiple reasons why people might want to buy your stuff. And I think it's good enough to sell. So let's get to it. So we have, I mean, I got one student in Singapore. I got one in Mexico City. And these are like my foreign correspondents. If they become good, they become outstanding sources. They become my local bureau chief in Singapore. I mean, it, it's, it's really exciting what we have going on with new media and being able to send our stories around the world. So I think having this professional understanding of how to work with the professional companies, this gets you into the big leagues, or at least gets you into double-A ball. Um, yeah. Writing stories for yourself and your own small audience of 200 Twitter followers, that's nice, okay? I'd rather that was 2,000, then 20,000, mm -hmm. then 200,000, or you getting paid two grand a month as a writer. So to make that happen, this is how you get in the door. This is how you present yourself to the people that got the checkbooks. Okay. All right. Well, I enjoyed our visit, and I'm glad we had the chance to do a makeup class. I'm going to go ahead and send this archive around, too, because uh, I think other people will get some ideas off of it. Yes, it was very informative. Thank you. All right, Deborah. Good talking to you, and uh, we'll visit again next week. Okay, have a great week weekend. Oh, you too. Good night. Good night.